Boy, I, I, I know like in the last semester, it just got like darker and darker and heavier and heavier. Um, starting with uh, this chapter and the next, like there's going to be these continual reminders of the victory of the Lamb. And so that's important to remember as we start out here. We're going to do a quick review um, and kind of cover like the general approach that we have to the book um, that, that I'm taking and just looking at the different resources. Uh, I thought I'd bring all of them in tonight uh, just, to, just to let everybody know what we're reading. Um, and I'm happy to read those off and... If you are, can Amazon those real fast, or, so, there you go, but uh, yeah, welcome back everybody, and I don't know about you, but I've been pretty excited about this, uh, I think since we stopped meeting in May, but uh, yeah, this is just reading ahead and knowing, you know, what's coming and everything else, and yeah, it's just, uh, it's exciting. So I hope you're excited too as we jump into this. Um, so let's, let's start with a word of prayer and then we can maybe open up to some questions or as we go through the review and we can kind of jog our memories and kind of get on the same page, right? All right, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the time that we can come together as your people to study your word, that you gave this revelation to John of what was and what is to come. And here we are 2,000 years later and still pouring over these words that we would live with hope that we would live inspired, that we would live with knowledge and wisdom. And Father, we pray that your spirit would embed those things in our hearts and minds. That no matter what we see going on around us in the world, that we will hold to your words of truth. That we can keep our eyes on you and live for your glory. We pray that in this time and time of peace and security, as much as we have, that we would take the time to study and to learn and to grow maybe before we approach a time of testing. So, Father, we pray. Your Spirit, guide and direct us through this study. Open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth, for us to be changed and transformed, and that you would be glorified through your people. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Okay. So, here we are. Everybody ready for a review? Yeah? Okay. So, uh, chapters one through three, we get into the seven churches. So, if... There's a quiz question of like, who wrote epistles in the Bible? Jesus better be named, right? He wrote seven of his own letters. Ah, uh, all right. So, so <laughs> starting off a little slow here. But we'll, we'll get momentum, yeah. So uh, next in chapters four and five, we have a seven sealed scroll. And which is amazing because nobody could be found to open it except for the lamb. And the lamb, because of what he had done in giving up his life. 
right? So let's actually go to chapter 5. Because John begins to weep because nobody is found worthy to open the book or the scroll and to break its seals. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. But as John's weeping, one of the elders said to him, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So I read that because this is like the cornerstone of everything that follows. Because it's the lamb and only the lamb who is able to break the seals. It's not the devil opening the seals. It's not the devil that's bringing these judgments upon the earth. Once again, an important piece to remember. So the first seal is a white horse. This person has a bow and a crown is given to it. And he goes out to conquer. The second seal is a red horse, represents war, and he's given a sword. The third, a black horse, represents famine. And so scales, just talking about the wheat, barley, the oil, and how much these things are worth. So you think about like economic troubles, like a market crash kidding too soon <laughs> all right it's rebound it's fine so pale horse number four death and then what is also kind of lumped into this in kind of a summary statement is pestilence like disease and wild beast so so this is what's referred to as the four horsemen And one of the ideas that was presented or theories, interpretive um, methods, and, and so we had talked about different approaches to Revelation, but one of which is that these things happen cyclically throughout history. Okay, And it's not just on a global scale, but within regions, within countries. And so these things are true and have happened since John's time, and some would even say before John's time, but will continue to happen until the end. Um, you know what? I think they could escalate leading up to the end. And let me also say is that as we unpa unpack some of the other judgments to come, and as we get towards the end of the book, we see a little bit of each of these in a global scale. So it's kind of a both and, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I want to um, also kind of head off is that people only think of this in a global way. And if it's not happening across the entire world, then it doesn't count. And all of a sudden, we've kind of thrown out the baby with the bathwater as we get into John's own context. 
which was Rome. And Rome is going to fit a lot of what we're going to be, what we've been reading, and what we're going to read in the coming chapters. And the approach is that these things happened and were fulfilled, but now they become a prophetic type for what is to come. So the more we understand John's context, we can see how that would translate into our own context. Does that make sense? Anybody need me to unpack that a little bit more? Okay, so just important to, to kind of understand and see this and how these seven scrolls, um, you know, in the fifth, we have martyrs. So these are the souls under the altar that are crying out for judgment. There's a great earthquake, and then there's an interlude where the 144,000 are sealed. And then seven, we have the silence in heaven, and then we quickly transition to trumpets. So that brings us to chapter eight. <clears throat> So in chapter 8, this is where we also start seeing more of a comparison with the plagues of, that were brought upon Egypt. So we see hail and fire mixed with blood, and so a third of the earth, trees, grass, are destroyed. The second trumpet, we see the, a mountain thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea becomes blood. Sound familiar? And we see creatures, a third of the creatures and a third of the ships destroyed. Third trumpet, a star falls to the earth. And a third of the rivers and springs are ruined. Uh, fourth, oh, and the spring is called, uh, or I'm sorry, the... Uh, the um, a star that fell from heaven is called Wormwood. So the fourth trumpet, a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars were struck so that a third of them would be darkened and the day would not shine for a third of it and the night in the same way. So this is chapter 8, verse 12. That's the fourth trumpet. Then we get introduced to the woes. So there was an, an eagle flying in midheaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So this is when we got into some pretty lively uh, discussion. Because <laughs> the fifth angel sounds his trumpet, and the bottomless pit, the key to the bottomless pit was given to him, and smoke went up out of the pit after it was unlocked, like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. But it's out of the smoke come locusts. Power was given to them, as scorpions of the earth have power. So this is what gives rise to, you know, just our own imagination. These locusts with scorpion tails, pinchers. But they weren't instruct they were instructed not to hurt the grass or anyone who had the seal of God on their forehead. So we already see a divine protection. Sixth trumpet, we have an army from the east. Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had prepared for the hour and the day and month and year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. 
The number of the armies of the horsemen were 200 million. I heard the number of them. So then we come to another interlude, whereas the first one was with the 144,000. Here we have the angel in the little book, chapter 10. So verse 9 of chapter 10, so I went to the angel I, telling him to give me the little book, and he said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And sure enough, it was. Then chapter 11, we have the two witnesses. And that was, the second woe has passed. Because in that was a earthquake in the time that the two witnesses are killed. And after they come back to life. In the seventh trumpet, we see Christ reign foreseen. And so this is really one of the, not the first time, but really one of the, the main points that we see that the book of Revelation is not written in chronological order that just as we see a cyclical pattern here, within the book itself, we see a lot of overlap. And whether you want to talk about it in, you know, just kind of a loop-de-loop -loop or a spiral, spiraling down to that point, right? Um, and so here, uh, in the seventh trumpet, we see Christ's reign foreseen. So the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, to, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. Uh, we could just stop the study right there, right? Because that's kind of the end. But it's not. Because after this, we actually go a little bit deeper and get more detail about the events we've already read about. And that's kind of the way to look at this is as we're, you know, going through and if you imagine the timeline, we're kind of jumping back into a point to look deeper at it. What's more of the detail? What is the experience of the nations? Who are the real big bad guys in this. And we're going to look at their role and how, and that's what's led us to some of those later chapters. Because we weren't covering this in the beginning of the book, but as we're going along, all of a sudden, some of the stuff is getting revealed in more clear detail. So, following that, Chapter 12, we have another interlude where basically it's like the backstory. Okay? And we had talked about this before. The woman, Israel, the red dragon, the male child, the angel Michael. We're flashing back to the birth of Jesus. And some of the things that happened during that time, during his life, and after his ascension. Because it's at that point that the devil goes and makes war against his disciples, against his people. And we also get a little bit more of a backstory of the dragon who was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So, 
Chapter 12 is that whole backstory. So if somebody was reading this and it's like, oh man, you know, this is getting really intense and they get to the seventh trumpet, it's like, hey, wait a second. How did all this start? It's literally like somebody asked that question and then boom, we get chapter 12. We're halfway through the book and it's like, oh yeah, you know what? Let's go back to the beginning here real quick. And part of that is because as we get into chapter 13 and we have the beast that we're going to be introduced to, where does their power come from? It's from the dragon. So it's completely a backstory because we're being introduced to a new main figure, the dragon, Satan, and his whole role in this. Because remember, up until this point, it's God's judgment. Is that everybody tracking? There's a lot of really serious looks here. I know we're not talking about sunshine and rainbows, but <laughs> so, um, yeah. So in chapter 13, we have the dragon who's standing on the seashore. And then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having 10 horns and seven heads. And on his horns were 10 diadems. And on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. So if you're thinking of Daniel chapter 7, good. Absolutely. Uh, and we read from that quite a bit last semester, didn't we? Everybody still have that memorized? <laughs> so, um, so this dragon is giving the beast, sea beast, right? The authority to carry out. And so we actually have timetables here to act for 42 months. Um, all the blasphemies, things like that. Remember, we're just on, we're on this spiral and we're going to go a little bit deeper and we're going to see who these individuals are and how they're embodied. And even just from this chapter, we see that the sea beast is representing the government and as well as the leader. So if you want to think Roman government and the emperor. But it doesn't stop there. So next we have the beast from the earth. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. So he didn't speak like the sea beast. He spoke like the dragon. That's an important piece there. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven, which is like the two witnesses, to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. 
And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. So, as we talked about before, the earth beast is a worship leader. Prominent spiritual leader. This is fitting for the imperial cult. who many times would lead persecution of Christians in surrounding cities because, because what the Christians were preaching was pretty much anti-Caesar. Jesus is Lord. Caesar is not. Jesus is Lord over the entire earth. Caesar is not. So, sea beast, earth beast. So we have the Roman Empire, the city of Rome, Emperor Nero. And so we got into a lot of the grammatria and just the numbers and what they mean for letters. And you would add those up and they would equate to certain names. And so Nero is the number one candidate for this antichrist, this the sea beast figure. So that's important for our understanding as we understand John's context and moving forward. Now, hopefully you hear what I'm saying because there's some people that talk, take a very dogmatic position, a preterist position, that everything in Revelation was fulfilled in 70 AD is not the case. I believe that much of it we do see happening in the first century. I wouldn't even just leave it to 70 AD, but the entire first century. But then we see much of it playing out, whether it be typologically or even some of these things happening cyclically over the last 2000 years awaiting its final culmination in the end. All of these things don't have to happen in a day or in a week or in a month. Many of these things could happen drawn out over time as a continual judgment. A continual maybe purging of the earth and drawing it to its close or its rebirth. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, so I think the whole idea with these happening cyclically, uh, they, they could. Now, what's interesting is when you look at, so like the white horse, a conqueror rolling up on the scene and all of a sudden, like, what do you do to conquer? You're not playing Yahtzee, right? And so <laughs> it's time to go to war. <laughs> and so, um, and then, you know, what happens after war? Yeah, you get famine. You get economic, I mean, destitution, right? Because, I mean, this is, that destroys an economy. Unless you're a part of the military industrial complex. And so, Day one, got to wait on this, right? So, but anyway, so with the conquer, you have war, you have famine, and then whenever there's famine, whenever there is not that nutrient base, right? Like that leaves everything root, open to pestilence, right? Disease coming in, ravaging a population, not to mention the invading army, bringing in diseases with it. And so you see all, I mean, yeah, so death. So a lot of these things can happen in its own order. And even, I mean, you could actually start anywhere within this 
and it kind of feeds upon itself because anytime you have maybe disease or death or all of a sudden this leads to civil unrest and all of a sudden somebody needs to be the hero and bring order. But then maybe people don't want that new order. And so there's resistance. And so that could be civil strife or maybe a neighboring country taking advantage of that. And uh uh-oh, did we get it? So, So this can all be drawn out over decades, months, an election cycle? Just kidding. All right. And so, so, but also like over a hundred years or a couple hundred years. So it's important to just know that, I mean, time is on God's side, right? And so, I mean, you can pick different regions around the world and you're seeing this happen in a year. And then in other places, maybe 250 years or longer. So, but where are the Christians in this? Now, there's many of those places where there is targeted persecution of Christians. So, now, down here, You get the great earthquake, the 144,000 sealed. They're not sealed um, up until this time. And then this opens up the trumpets. So now we're going to see this great earthquake appear later on, actually a couple more times. The splitting of Babylon or, you know, the great city, Rome. And so you could even argue that It's like these are reserved for the end. But up until this time, here's kind of what your cycle looks like. And then we get into some of this. And maybe this is that deepening part of it where it's that cleansing of the earth, that purging of the earth itself. So, any questions? It's a lot to take in. It's like, oh man, we've been asleep all summer and coming back to this. <laughs> so, uh, chapter 14, moving right along. We're going to get to 17. See, if I take the first hour for a review, and then some of you are wondering, hey, wait a second, we just spent like a year and a half on this, and you're summing it up in an hour? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> so, but here we have the lamb and the 144,000 appearing on Mount Zion. So, chapter 14. Then I looked, and behold, the lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000. Uh, also, we've talked about that number, whether it's 12 and 12 and 1,000. And so basically just think the kingdom of God, right? There could be a Jehovah's Witness joke right here. So, okay. So, but imagine like just all of the kingdom of God, 12 tribes, right? We get that number 12, the 12 sons of Jacob, turning into the 12 tribes, we've got 12 disciples, apostles, and we just, there's 12 gates in the new Jerusalem. So we see this number coming about, but what's in view, it's not literally 144,000, but the kingdom of God. Every believer. So sleep well at night. You don't have to worry if you're 144,001. Because there wouldn't be, but, you know, whatever. And so, <laughs> so uh, and I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. So we're seeing that 
same timetable over the last 2,000 years. They've been purchased. Well, what was the currency? The blood of Jesus Christ. These are the ones who have not been defiled. And so we can get into the imagery there, defiled with women. So you're looking at potentially that devotion and devotion to God alone. They have not worshipped other gods. They've not played the harlot like Israel did. For they have kept themselves chaste. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. And so here we have, And I saw another angel flying in midheaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and springs of waters. And another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. This is, this, these verses right here are extremely important because when we get into 17 and 18, it's going to be all about Babylon. So once again, the cyclical nature of it. Right here, we're reading about the fall of Babylon, but it's not fallen yet. So that's why this is not in chronological order. You could pretty much overlay it. Doom for the worshipers of the beast. Chapter 14, verses, verse 9. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So remember what we were talking about in the forehead and on the right hand, that's all about allegiance. If you want to take it literally as well as figuratively, like better safe than sorry, right? But it's what it's speaking to. And remember, like in Deuteronomy 6, we were to bind these things, the commands of God, to our right hands and to our foreheads. Basically, we were to live them out, to act upon them, and to think and meditate on them, to be renewed in our minds and in our actions. Because when we do that, we show who we are allegiant to. When we live and obey God, we show that we're allegiant to Him. We are loyal to Him. That's not what the beast wants. That's not what Rome wanted. They wanted Christians to burn incense and worship Caesar as Lord, to pledge their allegiance to Rome to do anything and everything that Rome said. And that included worshiping not only Caesar, but the gods of Rome. And that's why the first Christians were known as atheists, because they didn't believe in any of the Roman gods. So anybody that has received that mark on their forehead or on their hand, they are the ones that are being punished before God, before the Lamb. Tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. 
Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. So, I don't know about you, but we could probably stand to read that verse every day, just as a reminder. Before we, like, before our feet hit the ground, before we go out, leave the house, before we interact with somebody else, just to remember that everything we do in this life matters. To know that it will be carried into eternity. And we have the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us in this. It's like a cheat code for life. And we've already passed the test, so we don't have to worry about that. We're free to be unburdened by the sin of the world and to live in the Spirit in faithfulness. And then here in verse 14 of chapter 14, we're introduced to the reapers. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud Put in, your sickle, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the clouds swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So we see two different reapings there. One who looked like the Son of Man on the cloud, and then... The other one who is throwing his harvest into the winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the winepress up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Just when you think you figure it out, you're like, that's a lot of detail. Why is there so much detail? And we talked about a lot of this before in some of the, the peculiarities, the little details that come out. Um, so, so then we're, uh, we come upon a scene in heaven. The temple was filled with smoke. And the glory from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So that smoke being the holiness and the presence of God. So we have six bowls of wrath. And that is what we were working through last semester at the end there. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. So remember, in this overlap, in this cyclical part of it, we've already covered this. Babylon was doomed, all the earth has been harvested, but now we're going back and we're reading about those who received the mark. They've already been pressed if we were reading this in chronological order, but here we're jumping back. 
So the first angel went and poured out his bowl, and so they became loathsome and malignant sores. Only on those who had the mark. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood, like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. Everybody remember the uh, gruesome detail that we went in talking about that? <laughs> That's the stuff that leaves a mark, right? So obviously that sounds very much like the second trumpet. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and springs, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O Holy One, because you judge these things. So we've already been introduced to an angel of fire and now an angel of water. And he's not upset by this. He's declaring the righteousness of God. Is that a little weird? Is that a little peculiar? It is, just because that's never something we ever talk about. It's not a part of our Christian theology that we have angels responsible for elements, right? But here, the angel that had charge over those waters was declaring the righteousness of God, even as the very thing that he's responsible for is destroyed. And why is he declaring their, God's righteousness in this judgment? For they poured out the blood. Oh, and I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O Holy One, because you judge these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, oh, do you remember who was under the altar? Martyrs. And I heard the altar saying, yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and it was given, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Let's see. So we have... Oh, you know what? That was later on the trumpets. So men were scorched with the fierce heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. So the beast still has a throne. And his kingdom became darkened and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that they, so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. Well, we read about those guys in the trumpet judgments. Everybody seeing the overlap? And how this is just drawing these things deeper, right? We're getting more details, a little bit more of a sequential order within the different sets, potentially. And we've already talked about that order here. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. They're picking a fight. Behold, I am coming like a thief. So the, here's this is in brackets. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes. So we've got a practical note here so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. Whether this was a note added later on, somebody was most definitely concerned about this. So, practical wisdom, we can accept it. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Megedon. So, and we had a bunch of the maps and notes for that. Did everybody 
Anybody not get one of these? I know it's been three months. If you want one, okay. Just pass. Oh. <laughs> Awesome. Jim was just resting his eyes. Oh, what are you been thinking? I just handed it there. That was great. Oh boy, that was good. Thank so <laughs> Phil's safe in the back, at least he thinks so. Yeah, so far. Jim's gonna move the price. Leave. <laughs> Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds of peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake. Sounds like the uh, sixth seal. Such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth, so great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And we've already read about Babylon receiving that wrath for the last couple of chapters. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and huge hailstorms about 100 pounds each came down from heaven upon men. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. Somehow I feel like that's an understatement. 100 pound hailstones. It was extremely severe. How, how was the weather today? It was extremely severe. That was a warm up. So now we can jump into chapter 17. And uh, just a reminder, as I was talking before, um, so all the videos are up on YouTube. I think we're at 52. No, 54. 54. This is 55. This is 55. Okay. Wow, that's crazy. So, and David has done the hard work. And editing and making uh making it coherent and so <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> so but uh yeah all of those are on the uh, church's uh youtube page and uh on youtube and so on the website yeah so there you go. All right. Well, as we do, let's, uh, we are going to read the entire chapter of 17, and then we'll circle back around and do a commentary. Let me read just a uh, little bit from Mounts here as an introduction to like this section, okay? Because 17 verse 1 to chapter 19 verse 5 is kind of referred to as the fall of Babylon. Now remember, as we've already done in this review, we've already read about the fall of Babylon two or three times. But now we're getting into more detail about it. So, chapter 17 and 18, this is from uh, Mounts. There you go. Anytime somebody wants to see these resources, just let me know. And maybe here at the end I can read through all, all of them. I mean, like, the titles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so for Mounts, chapter 17 and 18 portray the judgment of God on the great, read, notorious prostitute, Rome, that citadel of pagan opposition to the cause of Christ. From a literary point of view, the two chapters are distinct. In chapter 17, the harlot appears in a vulgar display of the trappings of wealth and power and drunk with the blood of martyrs. In chapter 18, she is a city brought to ruins from her former position of world domination. After the opening vision, chapter 17, verses 1 through 6, John learns from an interpreting angel the meaning of its various symbols. 
The seven heads are both seven hills and seven kings. Its ten horns are ten kings who join the beast in warring against the Lamb. The waters on which the prostitute is seated represent the nations of the world. And the woman herself is the capital city of Rome. While the symbols themselves are not difficult to understand, the picture is complicated by such additional intricacies as the statement that the beast belongs to the seven, yet is an eighth king. Anticipating some bewilderment, the angel interpreter adds, here is a problem for a profound mind. By contrast, the following chapter, 18, is fairly clear. It is a dirge over the fallen capital. Kings, merchants, and all seafarers bewail its destruction. Echoes from the prophetic taunt songs of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel reverberate throughout the chapter. It is clear that both chapters deal with the same epic event, the downfall of Rome, the center of power and influence that is threatening the early church. Chapter 17 portrays the overthrow of Babylon in terms of the destruction of a prostitute who sits astride the scarlet beast and flaunts her vile profession. In chapter 18, the central meaning of this entire episode comes into sharp focus. The prostitute is a city, and that city is Babylon, that is to say Rome. Both chapters fill in in detail the essential meaning of the seventh bold judgment. Chapter 17 combines a fuller interpretation of the two visions of chapter 13 with the final outpouring of God's wrath as depicted by the last bowl judgment and sets the stage for the funeral dirge of chapter 18. From this point on, John is laying before us his own tale to two cities, the city of man, earthly Babylon, and the city of God, the Jerusalem above. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, is a great burst of heavenly jubilation over the fall of Babylon. It follows in stark contrast to the mournful dirges of chapter 18. It gives expression to the incredible rejoicing in heaven when the citadel of paganism and opposition to the people of God finally collapses. It prepares the way for the triumphal return of the Lamb and the establishment of the eternal reign of God. Well, there you go. We're all done. It just covers it. So. so that is what we are getting into with 17 and 18 and through the first five to 10 verses of 19. So that is our trajectory. That's where we're going. Um, so let's, and, and I think it's important to do that because even like what was alluded to, you know, from Mounts there is it's easy to get lost in certain details. Everything's there for a reason. And we know the direction that it's pointing. The question is, how does that fit? And why is that there, right? Um, but as we, and if anybody ever wondered, if you were in this class in the last three months, we were like, hey, that's still up there. Yeah, I left it up. That was totally an accident. But um, the whole idea is this is still ringing true as we read these chapters. And, you know, maybe if that's something we need to, you know, talk about, like from a historical perspective, you know, the fall of Rome, uh, what did that look like? Uh, because, because that's pretty interesting. Um, some scholars say, you know, Rome didn't fall in a day, right? The Roman Empire turned into the Byzantine Empire. I mean, the last emperor of Rome was in Constantinople. Unless you count the Holy Roman Empire. And it just kind of branches out from there, right? Um, you know, the, the Vandals that sacked Rome were Christian. That's a little bit of irony, right? The barbarians of the north were Christians, and they conquered Rome. It's a 
beautiful irony. Come on, that's great stuff. And so, you know, so there's plenty to like, you know, talk about there. Um, if you've ever uh, read Edward Gibbons, uh, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, it's amazing. It's poetic. It's beautiful. It is dense. You could audiobook it. Reading it is awesome, uh, but audiobooking, like, especially if you've got somebody with a good voice, it's good stuff. It really is. And it goes into like crazy detail. Um, but, anyways, like, that's what we're reading about here. So, from where we're at, we're reading about certain events that have happened, but remember, we're understanding this from a prophetically typological perspective. That as we saw then, so it will happen in the end. And remember, like they kind of saw Rome as ruling the world. At least their world, right? There was the Persian Empire in the east, or the Parthian Empire, as they were referred to, in the east. And yeah, there was all kinds of battles and skirmishes along, you know, in Turkey and Syria. Um, and, you know, over that control. And, and they even fought over Israel, over the promised land in different times. So they didn't control the entire world. But yet, as it's presented... With the might of Rome, they were the ones that were persecuting Christians at that time. They were the ones that crucified Jesus. So bringing all that into perspective, Rome is the bad guy here. Now, you have the army of the east, clearly refers to the Parthians. That's modern day Iran. I don't know how that could be relevant, but we'll just keep reading. <laughs> Come on. <It's... laughs> okay, chapter 17. <laughs> I like when it gets real, like, just stone cold quiet. It's like, it's like, can he say that? He just said that, but can he say that? It's... <laughs> That's okay. David has editing powers. <laughs> <laughs> Only if he wants to use them. That's right. <laughs> All right, here we go. Chapter 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm breaking my own rule here, but as I'm reading through this and we're talking about the harlot, and even if it says Babylon or whatever, think Rome, right? How did these nations, like one, why is she called a harlot? What acts of immorality were committed and uh, these other nations were drawn into that? So they were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. 
the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth, whose name has not whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast, that he was and is not and will come. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven and he goes to destruction. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose and they give their power and authority to the beast. Verse 14. These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with Him are the called and chosen and faithful. And He said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman whom you saw is the great city, which reigns over the kings of the earth. I heard some snickers where it got really confusing. <laughs> you said from verse 17? Confusing. <laughs> from chapter 17 there, yep. So, all right. Uh, let's see. Starting with uh, Craig Keener, uh, his commentary on the uh, New Testament. So although the Old Testament usually reserved figurative use of the designation prostitute for God's faithless people, it was also appropriately applied to mighty mercantile or military sinners. Thus, Isaiah 23, verses 16 and 18 portrayed Tyre, as a prostitute who served all the kingdoms of the world. Nineveh, as capital of a world empire, also was called a harlot and sorceress, who sold nations into slavery by both devices. That's from Nahum chapter 3, verse 4. Allusions to both passages appear in Revelation 18 and 19. Sorcery and prostitution are also linked in Isaiah 57, verse 3. The false prophetess portrayed earlier in the book might appear as an agent of the system. Revelation 2.20. So that Jezebel. So parallels and contrasts between Babylon the prostitute in this passage and the New Jerusalem the bride in chapter 21 fit the practice in apocalyptic literature and other sources, sources such as wisdom literature of contrasting the righteous and the wicked. One need not assume that John's prophecies of Babylon apply only to Rome. Other evil empires have also come and gone because Rome was the Babylon of John's day. However, it supplies the images for John's original audience in the seven churches. So that's from Craig Keener. So, and he doesn't always agree with Mounts, uh, but I think in the general concept, most people, when we get to this part, when, when most scholars get to this section, like, it is evident that who is being talked about here is Rome. And then how they fit that into, like, their eschatology, their end times belief. 
like that's where it kind of diverges. Whether it stays with Rome or you approach it typologically where like, oh, wait a second, we've seen many different empires rise and fall. And a lot of them sounded just like what we're reading. But in the end, there will be that one. Now, could I be wrong on that? Could there be a hundred different kingdoms with many different antichrists, all persecuting Christians across the world? There could. I think typologically, like, it, it could. There's a lot of language that kind of makes it fit into, like, one. But, as a teacher, I would not want anybody to be deceived. Right? Well, Luke said, that doesn't hold a candle to what God said. <laughs> Luke interpreted it wrong. <laughs> so, I don't want to hear that in eternity. So, <laughs> so, so I would rather you like have maybe a spectrum of interpretation rather than, man, Luke was really convincing that one day. So, um, and that's a little glimpse into my own mind of like, oh yeah, it could be applied this way or this way or this way or this way or this way. So, um, but I won't trouble you with those other three ways. I'll just give you those two. <laughs> oh man, first one back. It's like, <laughs> had all this pent up all summer and so here it is. So, um, all right. So that was from Keener. Let's go back to Mount here. And I really liked a lot. I mean, it's just so, yeah, he did a really good job, um, you know, communicating what we are seeing here. So in regards to, like, we're going to work through these first six verses. So verse one, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. So, the prostitute is pictured as sitting upon many waters. According to verse 15, the waters are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So, since the prostitute is later named Babylon the Great, in chapter 17, verse 5, it would appear that this part of the description comes from Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 13, where Babylon is said to dwell by many waters. The reference to the numerous canals that distributed the waters of the Euphrates to the surrounding territory symbolizes the influence of Rome as it flows out through the entire world. Does everybody see that connection? Like many times what you have, anytime that there's water, it generally represents like the multitudes, peoples, right? And so even as you see like a beast rising up out of the sea. So. Verse two, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. So the kings of the earth who have committed adultery with the great prostitute are the nations who have entered into illicit relations with Rome. They represent the apostate nations that Rome has enticed into idolatrous worship of herself and the beast. The influence of her pernicious doctrines has spread to the entire pagan population. The inhabitants of the earth are further identified in verse 8 as those whose names have not been written in the book of life. Ouch. They are portrayed as drunk with the intoxicating influence of Rome's seductive practices. In a somewhat similar way, Jeremiah pictured Babylon as a gold cup in the Lord's hand whose wine the nations drank and went mad. 
So let's go ahead and go to Jeremiah 51. That's the second time that that is referenced. And, you know, we couldn't go the entire time without getting into the Old Testament here. So this is basically 64 verses of judgment on Babylon. But we are just going to read the first eight verses. Maybe. Did you say maybe? <laughs> I was thinking it. It's like maybe. I'm, I'm still looking here. Maybe we'll go to 14. All right. <laughs> Thus says Yahweh. Uh, so for anybody that doesn't know, when you see Lord, all capital letters, that's actually the name of God, Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh, Behold, I am going to arouse against Babylon and against the inhabitants of Leb Kamai, the spirit of a destroyer. I will dispatch foreigners to Babylon that they may winnow her and may devastate her land. And on every side they will be opposed to her in the day of her calamity. Let not him who bends his bow bend it, nor let him rise up in his scale armor. So do not spare her young men, Devote all her army to destruction. They will fall down, slain in the land of the Chaldeans, and pierced through in their streets. For neither Israel nor Judah has been forsaken by his God, Yahweh Shavuot. So remember that title is the Lord of Armies. Or the Master of Armies. Although their land is full of guilt, before the Holy One of Israel, flee from the midst of Babylon, and each of you save his life. Do not be destroyed in her punishment, for this is Yahweh's time of vengeance. He is going to render recompense to her. Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of Yahweh, intoxicating all the earth. The nations have drunk of her wine, therefore the nations are going mad. Suddenly Babylon has fallen and been broken, Wail over her, bring balm for her pain, perhaps she may be healed. We applied healing to Babylon, but she was not healed. Forsake her, and let us each go to his own country, for her judgment has reached to heaven and towers up to the very skies. Yahweh has brought about our vindication. Come and let us recount in Zion the work of Yahweh our God. Sharpen the arrows, fill the quivers. Yahweh has aroused the spirit of the kings of the Medes because his purpose is against Babylon to destroy it. For it is the vengeance of Yahweh, vengeance for his temple. Lift up a signal against the walls of Babylon. Post a strong guard, station sentries, place men in ambush. For Yahweh has both purposed and performed what he spoke concerning the inhabitants. Of Babylon. O oh, you who dwell by many waters, abundant in treasures, your end has come, the measure of your end. Yahweh Shavuot has sworn by himself, surely I will fill you with a population like locusts, and they will cry out with shouts of victory over you. So you can already see some of the you know references there. Um, the level of judgment that was being brought against. If you're not familiar, the Medes and the Persians. Um, so these were, this was the Persian, um, you know, empire that was taking over Babylon. So this is Cyrus the Great. But we see the reference there for, you know, just a cup in the Lord's hand and how we're making drunk these surrounding nations. So, what was that drunkenness like? What was being perpetuated there? Was it just paganism? Well, they were all pagan. Was it wealth? Was it being grafted into their own system? Their allegiance to their ruler who was deified? 
So all those different things converge. Now, as we read this and talk about this, who was in Babylon at this time? Israel, Israel yeah. Judah had been carted off, like taken captive. Who was serving in the Babylonian beast government? Daniel. Daniel. And he had three friends. I'm sure he had more friends than that. But, <laughs> but they were serving in that government. So, so this is kind of one of those things that like, as we're talking about this, you know, it's easy. It's like, oh yeah, you know, stay away from government, stay away from, you know, all of that. Oh, wait a second. God in his own purposes are putting people into place to represent him. Now, was it an easy time for Daniel? No. Not at all. Did it almost require his life a few times? Uh, yeah. Does it work out that way every time? Nope. <laughs> so that, like, that's one of those things to, to understand is if you're going into the belly of the beast, as the Lord calls you to, oh, well, you know, don't be surprised if it turns and devours you. But ultimately, here we are to serve the Lord and to represent him wherever he calls us to be. So whether it be Daniel or his three, now mind you, we all know that Daniel didn't just go willingly. He was a captive and they took the brightest of the young men and said, hey, you are going into service. So whatever you want to do with that. I'm just here to muddy the waters. But point being is when we read about the acts of immorality, we really do need to think about what this looks like. And th this is what it means for us to like study this and really kind of read it. And it translates into like a devotional aspect of it. We got to know what those immoralities are and we can't just leave it at paganism. It goes further than that. And we were talking a little bit about this on the break. It's any of those things that maybe we know and understand is just maybe commonplace to our lives today in this empire. What is it that is a distraction from serving God? Is it our comforts? Is it air conditioning? No, I praise him for that. I know you praise him for that. <laughs> Don't you wish I was asleep now? <laughs> <laughs> no, Jim. <laughs> but no, I mean, there's all kinds of things that maybe, maybe it is wealth. Maybe it is a 401k. What are those things that are holding us back from serving the Lord? What are those strings that maybe a beast has attached? And I'm not saying all of those things are evil or whatever. We just, as Christians, we need to think critically. Here we are, however long that we have lived and walked upon this earth, boom. We have been dropped here within the last hundred years, 1,900 years, or if you want to say 1,600 years since the Roman Empire, since, you know, 2,000 years since John wrote these things. And here we are walking the earth to, as part, as members of the kingdom of God, as priests, to further the kingdom of God. And if you live under a government, you live in an empire. Whether it's the empire of Cuba or the empire, you know, as we, the beast of Cuba, the beast of America, the beast of whatever, beast equals government. This isn't an anarchist rant, just for clarity. 
Because there's always, there's always somebody that's ruling. That, that's, that's what I'm saying. The question is, what are our ties to it? Where is our allegiance and how does that manifest itself in our lives? It's a fun topic of conversation in an election year. <laughs> but election year or not, it's something that every Christian needs to know and understand. And this is the, like, this is a big part of the book of Revelation. It's a warning. And, and you know, like, where's this as a part of our discipleship? Where, has, have you ever heard any of this before? And is this something that can be replicated and passed along? It's an important message. I mean, and governments can turn or somebody can take them over in a day. So it's pretty interesting. I mean, you know, just studying history and looking at those that persecuted Christians. But persecution isn't everything. It's not the only thing to fear. Because what we're reading about here, especially with Babylon and with the harlot here representing Rome, is decadence. It's wealth. And all the other immoralities that come along with that. It's that whole idle hands, right? Somebody's workshop. So... <laughs> And that's what luxury provides. You've got time on your hands to indulge into whatever. And those are the things we have to be careful of because we can either devote the time, the limited time that we have in our lives to service to God or to a different God. Once again, I just think I want to mount a mirror right here so you guys can see your faces. It'd be great. <laughs> I just wish you could see what, what I see. <laughs> I don't know if I like this class anymore. <laughs> That's what you're thinking, <laughs> not me. <laughs> so anyways, I don't want to beat that drum too much. I already have. But... You know, it, it's still, it, this is something that is going to come up and it's how are we going to think about this? It's real easy to just kind of categorize it like, oh, it's emperor worship. We don't do that. You know, or, oh, it's paganism. You know, it's worshiping all of those gods. Well, we got rid of those because Christianity conquered the West. No, we just, we made different gods. Gold is still a god, right? Or fiat currency, whatever. And so, money. It doesn't have to be like this little figurine. So, but, all right, verse three. Unless anybody has questions. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemies, blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. So John is now carried away into a desert to watch the coming judgment of the prostitute. John has a front row seat. Four times in Revelation, John is said to be in the Spirit. Chapter 1, verse 10. Chapter 4, verse 2. Or, carried away in the Spirit, chapter 17, verse 3, and chapter 21, verse 10. Can you yeah, I can repeat those. So, in the Spirit, chapter 1, verse 10, and chapter 4, verse 2. And then, carried away in the Spirit, that's chapter 17, verse 3, what we just read, and chapter 21, verse 10. So the reference is 
is to that state of ecstasy in which John experienced the entire visionary experience recorded in Revelation. It does not necessarily point to some new state of exaltation that came over him. In this context, the desert is not a place of divine protection and nourishment, as we've read in other places, like with the woman being taken from the dragon, right? She goes out into the wilderness. But an appropriate setting for a vision of judgment. It may have been suggested by the opening statements of Isaiah's oracle against Babylon in chapter 21. In the course of Jewish history, the desert had often been the setting for unusual and visionary experiences. So we have Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 and following. Moses. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4. And then Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, the temptation of Jesus. As the vision begins to unfold, John sees a woman seated upon a scarlet beast that she was earlier said to be sitting upon many waters should cause no problem. The constantly shifting scenes of apocalyptic should not be taken with a rigidity that imposes artificial conformity on its symbols. Right? So we're not limiting ourselves like, hey, wait, she was on waters, now she's on a scarlet beast. It shouldn't be a problem. So it's the great persecuting power that rules by brute force and is the supreme enemy of Christ and the church. The scarlet color does not necessarily convey an idea such as magnificence, nor is it symbolic of the blood of martyrs. Rather, it is primarily descriptive and heightens the terrifying appearance of the beast. Like its master, the great red dragon of chapter 12, it is terrifying to behold. So basically what you're seeing with the red is just that embodiment. It's that its own allegiance is not to God, it's to that dragon. Blasphemous names cover its entire body. The reference is to the blasphemous claims to deity made by Roman emperors who employed such titles as Theos, divine, Soter, savior, and Kyrios. Lord. So all those names were devoted to Caesar. They were used regularly of Caesar. The blasphemies are not so much directly spoken against God by the beast as they are implied by his self-deification. The beast, like the dragon of chapter 12, has seven heads and ten horns. So these will be interpreted later. So this is the same number as the dragon of chapter 12. No, because what we see is the dragon giving that power and authority to the beast. So remember, we're kind of circling back around to the sea beast and earth beast. Uh, any other questions on that? On verse 3. All right, moving right along. Verse 4. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. So the woman who sits astride the scarlet beast is clothed in luxurious garments and adorned with gold and costly jewels. Purple and scarlet signify the luxury and splendor of ancient Rome. Both dyes were expensive to extract. Purple was often used for royal garments. We even see that in Judges chapter 8, verse 26, and Daniel chapter 5, verse 7. And scarlet was a color of magnificence. Nahum chapter 2, verse 3. 
The costly and spectacular garb of the prostitute should be contrasted with the fine linen, bright and clean, worn by the bride of the Lamb. That we'll read about in Revelation 19, verse 8. (coughs) The prostitute is lavishly adorned with gold and precious stones. In her hand, she holds a golden cup that promises a, a heady draught of carnal satisfaction. Its contents, however, are quite otherwise. The cup is full of the abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. Some translation. Moral corruption and all manner of ceremonial uncleanness are what she offers. Verse 5, and on her forehead... A name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So the description of the prostitute continues with special attention to the name written on her forehead. There are seven other references in Revelation to the marking of the forehead. So that's eight altogether. In chapter 13, verse 16, chapter 14, verse 9, and chapter 20, verse 4, the mark is the mark of the beast. Elsewhere, it is the seal or name of God. That's chapter 7, verse 3, chapter 9, verse 4, Chapter 14, verse 1. And chapter 22, verse 4. Placing the name upon the forehead, probably upon a headband, appears to have been a custom of Roman courtesans. The NIV includes mystery as part of the inscription, following the punctuation of... uh, different scholar, but is better understood as indicating that the name is to be understood in a mystical rather than literal sense. Certain translations will have written on her forehead was a name with a secret meaning instead of mystery. Only those to whom the meaning is revealed will grasp the full significance of the title. So, the prostitute is Babylon the Great, the great system of godlessness that leads people away from the worship of God and to their own destruction. Specifically, she is Rome, who, like Babylon of old, has gained a worldwide reputation for luxury, corruption, and power. Not content with her own evil vice, She spawns her harlotry and abominable practices throughout the world. She is the mother of whores and of every obscenity on earth. Tacitus describes Rome as the place where all the horrible and shameful things in the world congregate and find a home. If I remember right, he wasn't even speaking specifically of Caligula. So, (laughs) nerd humor, okay. Certainly, uh, Juvenal's account of the vile and debasement of the Roman Empress Messalina, who served incognito in the public brothels, is an indication of the depths of immorality in the ancient capital. So, there's just all these instances of emperors and empresses who did abominable things who exacted that upon all those around them. So, along with killing Christians, along with sending them into exile, or putting putting them into slavery. So on top of all that, 
It was just them living and living in ways that were completely and totally contrary to God. But at the same time, them referring to themselves as God. So, don't be deceived. A lot of times, it's easy when, you know, like, oh yeah, they just declared themselves God. Like, oh, that's a big no-no, I should run the other way. But what if they do everything else but that? That's the part we have to pay attention to. All right, so, we just made it through five. We will pick up at six. We got five whole verses in. Woohoo! Woo High five. <laughs> and a review. That's right. So, hey, thank you guys for coming back, being a part of this. Um, yeah, I'm excited to get through this book, and it'll happen this fall. I guarantee it. That's my Jim Cramer statement for today. So, all right. God bless. You guys have a wonderful week. See you next Sunday evening.